And God just brings humble servants to participate in humble activities that are changing lives in powerful ways because we serve a powerful God. Hello, and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Elijah Weiss. The ministry of Crosstalk has hit the milestone of 50 years working for the Lord. And in celebration, we're taking a look back through the years at where Crosstalk has come from. What you will see today is a series of interviews discussing the early years of Crosstalk as a TV ministry and the involvement of family, and how God has continued to equip us and move us forward in ministry. I hope you find these stories as interesting as I did. Let's jump right in. You know, we talked about family, and I know me, myself, obviously I'm involved in the ministry. I've been in some commercials growing up, um, my brother and sister as well, my, some music videos me and my cousins have been in. So Crosstalk is very clearly a family ministry. I'm, I'm a producer and editor here. My father, my uncle was a producer and editor here. They ran the cameras. My other cousins have run social media. You know, we've all done our little bits. Um, other cousins have been interns. So this is very clearly a family ministry. Was that your goal from the beginning? No, no, it wasn't. I, uh, I don't know how this happened. I, you know, I just have been trying to do what I'm supposed to do. And along the way I needed help. And at, at different times, family members just wanted to help and we needed help. Some of these stories, we were a part of, or we, we were, you know, in the middle of, or we've heard them, of course, but, you know, I'm sure the audience doesn't really know a lot of that history. They probably also don't know how things started with, with you getting involved, because I was still in high school, but I remember, you know, you guys would be filming in the house. When I started, um, I was a very uh, poorly paid college student um, and I was just filling in a gap. It was more of a circumstance. I can't say that I started here because I sought out ministry. Um, I started here because I was filling a need and you know I think much of my career I was the guy we had not the guy we needed. Um, and I, I say that you know it, it probably puts me in a poor light. We met the challenges you know dad did, I did, you know the ministry did. But I wasn't equipped. I wasn't an editor. Uh, I don't have the creative uh, talent that you and your dad have, um, but I have a technical mind. And at that time specifically, um, I think that was probably one of the more important things for uh, a ministry of, of this type because it was an age in which we were transitioning, the industry was transitioning. So the ability to have, a, I'm gonna say, a technical or mechanical mind played an important role in those days because it wasn't necessarily about talent, at least not creative talent. You know, we joked that there were a lot of networks that were blind <laughs> at that time because the early days that of the stuff we produced, just it didn't have the quality of production that we put out today. Um, but the content was new and fresh and it was important. And it was the content that carried the program, not what I did. Um, now we got better. And you know, part of the things that I think dad is remembering, I don't know, impressed is the wrong word, but I think that we're an important thing to the ministry is we had challenges everywhere we turned, whether it was learning how to edit, learning how to produce, learning how to run cameras. There was a gentleman out of Los Colinas that came down and he taught us how to set up the cameras or set up the camera at that time. Uh, we talked about it in the living room and, and he told us how to back focus and rack focus and you know try and set the shot and frame the shot and light the shot and you know to run audio and uh, he recorded a handful of programs and then, you know, it was dad and I and every time we'd have to unpack the equipment and set it all up and... And then we recorded at the house uh, quite a number of programs when uh, actually that was pretty much of a hardship on the family. It was actually quite a nice 
set, I, if I recall. I thought it was a nice set because mom had a, did a good job with the interior design of the house. And so she would, she gets credit for the set design, but uh, you still had to put bed sheets up or something to. We had bed sheets on the wall so that it would give some texture and color and uh, the networks didn't know that we were taping in our house. It looked like a studio set, um, but it was our house and it looked like a multi-camera shoot, but we only had one camera. Yeah, how, so how did, you, how did you enjoy doing that? Well, it was wonderful. So to walk, walk, <laughs> walk us through it. I mean, I know it, but walk us through it. You, you did, the, it depends how many cameras you want and how many times you shot the program, because <laughs> you shot it film style one camera and then you reset and shot again and, <laughs> and dad has to give be given credit because he prepared his scripts preparing for the turns which I think added to the aesthetic of the program. Zeddy with his time when he was with Lassie, Lester Summerall's World Harvest, um, he was accustomed to preparing the content here in Texas and bringing the scripts for the teleprompter to South Bend, Indiana to record. So he had to be fully prepared um, with his stuff timed out. And so he would write it, he would research it, and then he would practice it to see what he believed the time would be so that he knew that the content that he needed to get into the program wouldn't get left on the cutting room floor. And so Sid, Zadie did a really good job of preparing the program content at that time. Much of what we did was Zadie behind the desk um, or teaching or prepared interviews. It wasn't the freeform stuff that we tend to do it now. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was prepared for the teleprompter. Zadie would send it to us in advance and we'd prepare everything. It wasn't teleprompted because for any other reason than he didn't want to mess up. He didn't want to say the wrong thing, provide the wrong information, and he believed that there was very specific messages that needed to get out. Mm -hmm. And he worked very hard to make sure that that wasn't off the cuff. Um, and, and he also did a very good job of, and does a very good job of regurgitating that information with the prompter as though it's still fresh and new content, yeah. not because it's anything other than his own words. I mean, he prepared it. Um, it's not like a newscast where you're reading somebody else's yeah. words. Um, so for me as an editor, I producer, I think is a stretch. Um, it was helping to take what he had prepared and put it into a visual format. So instead of one camera, he was... would be giving his, you know, the teaching and he would know it was time to turn and he would turn and finish his sentence and then we would shoot the whole program in that way and every turn and then you'd pick up and you'd shoot the whole way and he had to know which way he was turning to turn back to. yeah <laughs> okay and there had to be times where you you had the wrong turn right uh, surely sure there was times right? where you had the wrong turn well it was it was challenging because we had the camera set up in the kitchen shooting into the family room and then the next shoot we would move to the other side of the kitchen and there was kind of like a, an open window that wasn't a window from the kitchen to the family room and we would shoot through that opening and then uh, if deemed necessary, we'd come back from the other side altogether. So it was, uh, it was really a lot of work and then after well, everything- The family had to be gone because we would shoot when the kids were in school. And... Okay, like if I'm honest, Mom, I definitely remember it being a little tense sometimes because he basically took over the house and you were allowed to, you were like a prison in your own home. I was evicted. <laughs> she, she really enjoyed when they were interviewed. You, you were evicted. You were home, weren't you? You had to leave the house. Had to or chose How did this to? marriage last so long? <laughs> like, how did this marriage last? So we literally had to, every time we would begin taping, block out all the windows and throw the family out because, and turn the phones off. You know, they were all landlines, but you had to unplug all the phones because you couldn't have noise. And uh, with six kids 
and only one of them helping with the production. That left five kids to just make noise. So, so you understand why I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it was really a, a torture to the family for taping when we would shoot programs. And it would take all day because when you have to shoot the same program multiple times from multiple angles to have it look like a real TV show, um, it was really a, 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 a real challenge to, to mom and, and to the family. But everybody cooperated until mom kicked us out. <laughs> and she was right to. I mean, she was right to get fed up and say, you can't do this here anymore. Well, Josh, when did, when did you start? I started in 98. When uh, your dad graduated high school, he had a scholarship to a really fine art school. He's a very talented artist. And uh, he was all set, you know, and we were happy for him. And he came to me one day and he'd been praying about it. And he's just a kid, you know, graduating high school and getting ready to go to college. And he said, Dad, I've been really praying about it. And I'm thinking that maybe instead of going away to school, I should stay here and go to Bible college and then I can help you. And I thought, <laughs> praise the Lord. Because <laughs> I couldn't ask him to do that. And uh, he wanted to be an artist. He had a scholarship. He was going away to school. He didn't want to stay at home in mom and dad's house, you know. I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> but God touched his heart. And he had seen his older brother, Caleb, uh, you know, helping us. Caleb was the only help <laughs> we had. We wouldn't be able to get a program out of it if Caleb hadn't helped. And he realized that uh, the ministry had expanded and there was just a lot of stuff that needed to be done and we were having a hard time doing it. And he believed he could do it. And as, as it turned out, I think it was wonderful that your dad went to a local Bible college instead of going off to this fancy art school and uh, he volunteered to stay and live at home. It cost a lot less. It, we've helped our kids to make sure they didn't end up having to go through school and then have enormous, spend the rest of their life trying to pay for school bills. So they went to very, they went to less expensive schools and thank God we were able to help them. But your dad was gifted and God enabled him to just do remarkable things. And when, when he took over doing the work that he did for our productions, it was as the ministry was transitioning and there were things going on in the broadcast space that I was trying to do that your uncle Caleb ended up having to, he had the skill set to do those things. And your dad had the skill set to do the things that Caleb had been doing and in fact even better for the ministry, different, you know? So God just equipped um, both of them in different ways. And they're both highly respected in the industry, in the broadcast space uh, and in the ministry production space, in the technology space. Um, it's incredible how they have advanced uh, I don't know how God did it, and, but God did it. God's good. He does all things well. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have any background in, in like production. I didn't have any background in, uh, I don't know, really most of the things you would expect that were requirements to kind of work with the television ministry. My, my background all through junior high and high school was, you know, arts. I mean, I did lots of the creative stuff. I mean, I did some sports and stuff, but I was big into the the different arts. And so my, my professor, my, my teacher was really great. Mr. Wheat. We, uh, we learned everything from pottery to sculpting, to painting, to drawing. Um, I mean, you, you name it, we were, we were doing it all. And so between that and uh, a program that the church has fine arts, uh, fine arts festival, which the church does, I was pretty involved in the different creative arts, right? And so 
when I graduated, um, it, it was kind of a natural fit for the, for the ministry to kind of help out with some of the creative side. And so when I came in, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of along the lines of, Hey, what, what do we, what can we change creatively, you know, to, to up, update the set or, um, redo, you know, the look and feel about this or that or graphics. And, and so I put some of those creative skills to work for the first couple of years. I was going to Bible college at Christ for the nations, which was the same school that we moved down to Texas for so that Zadie could go to college. Um, so I was going to Christ for the nations. And while I was at Christ for the nations, I'd, I'd go to the office and I'd just kind of do whatever they were needing. But it was like, it was like my gas might be covered or maybe my car insurance was covered. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, like a, a job. Don't get me wrong. It was a job. <laughs> it was definitely a job, but it wasn't, it wasn't your standard nine to five. So when you're going in and you're kind of fitting in, you, you fit in wherever you're needed and they, they would kind of give guidance and point out, Hey, can you do this? Or can you help with that? And, and along the way you learn different things. So as things get bigger, you start to do more things, you know, you're a small team. So, you know, it might be a situation where Caleb's got too much on his plate. Hey, I need you to start making these tape dubs. Here's how you do it. You push these buttons, you do this, and you know, this is your process. And then you start going through that. And then, and then eventually it got to the point where I was doing the, uh, the editing. And at the editing, I'd go through and I'd kind of go through the process and I might not agree with the look and feel of things, but I was learning the process to begin with. And then as we get going a little further, then I start to have some creative ability to, to make some tweaks. But all along the way, for the longest time, I might go through uh, you know, the first few rough cuts or edits of the, the, the whole program or the episode. And then Zadie would come back and he would watch and he'd make a punch list of, hey, you gotta do this at this time, do this at this time, do this. So it was a, it was very much a process. And in that process, there was learning in that process. There was me being able to influence. And over time, it just kind of morphed into, you know, me taking over the role of producer and, and, uh, you know, responsible for, for the program in general. Ultimately, what we aim for in general, when it comes to crosstalk or to day with God or wise fix, wise flicks or, or, um, you know, international broadcasting network everything that we're doing. If we're doing something for the Lord, we want to bring excellence. And excellence in some respects might mean you hire the best, you pay the most, and you make it be, you know, at the same caliber of what Hollywood will put out. And I think that's, that's the goal. You want to be better than Hollywood, right? Uh, I think a better way to look at it from my perspective is we're called to excellence. And what excellence looks like is, is giving your very best. So you give your all, you give 110%, 110% of the time, and you leave nothing out on the field, so to speak. And so when I think of anything I've done, and there's, there's times where I haven't, I haven't been as good, um, but the, the, the heart and the motivation, I think that everybody tries to do here is just give your best, be obedient, not, not just to my dad, but be obedient to the Lord and um, just know that everything you're doing is for the Lord. And when you're doing everything that you're doing because it's for the Lord, your motivation isn't the paycheck. Your motivation isn't a fame of any kind. Your motivation is just something that's pleasing to the Lord. And I think that Caleb's done that. I think dad's done that. I've tried to do that. Jennifer's done that. Everybody that's been involved with the ministry has tried to do that. And it just, the outcome just looks different because we've got different strengths that God's gifted us with. If we all know that we're working towards a specific goal of making an impact in the world, of making a difference, then you can measure everything against that goal. Is what I'm doing today working towards the goal of making an impact, of changing the world, of, of touching lives, right? And that seems a little bit ethereal or, or a little bit too um, uh, difficult to pin down. But that's the reality of it. And when we've got testimonies and experiences where you, we walked in faith or we gathered together and walked in faith and we saw some fruit or you know, faithfulness of God come through difficult times, 
it encourages us and it reminds us that we're on the right path. And so you get those, those histories of God's faithfulness and that propels you forward to the next one, knowing that, you know, I don't know where, I don't know when that's coming, but I know it's coming because God never leaves us or forsakes us. He's faithful always. Honestly, God has made a way. He's always made a way. And I mean, there's been so many times I have felt or my sons have felt or you may have felt we need more this or we need more that. We need more money. We need more stuff. We need more tools. We need more whatever. I have a pretty standard answer. Yeah, we probably do. And when God agrees, he'll provide it. Until then, let's just do the best we can with what we have. And when we've fully used it up, God's going to provide more. He will. And that's just how he's done things. He's faithful. He loves, he loves us. And it's not like we got to twist God's arm to do his work. I don't know who came up with that idea, but this is, this is going to be terrible. I probably shouldn't say it, but I, I heard a, uh, Indian guru on some YouTube thing yesterday. And he had a really long gray beard and really long gray hair and he sat with his legs crossed and he was the guru. One kind of guru or another. I don't know. I don't mean I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm sure some people really revere him. But as I was listening to him, he was brilliant. I, I loved it. Uh, I, I'm not a Hindu or a Buddhist or whatever that guy was. I don't know what he was. I didn't listen long enough. But I loved what he said. It was essentially, whoever said you have to worship harder or pray harder or work harder? What about worshiping more joyfully? What about praying more hopefully? What about working with to rejoice in what you do? I mean, and I just wanted to shout, Amen, Hallelujah, because the dude was right. It's right. We, we don't have to, there's no benefit to like, uh, flagellation, you know, beating ourselves on the back with a whip. We, we should work enthusiastically and joyfully and hopefully because God has called us to do this wonderful thing. What is it that we're called to do? If we don't lose sight of the simplicity of it, it's declarative. We declare the love of God and the coming of Messiah. That's not hard. We don't have to make stuff up. We don't have to sweat bullets and, and bleed to, to do this. Some people do. They, my friend, is serving God in a region where 120 churches were destroyed recently. There's some people who have bled. Okay, I, I'm not minimizing that. His response to me when I said, oh, this is tragic, I'm so sorry you're exper experiencing that. His response to me today was basically you know, these are times that we get to suffer. These are times that will build our faith. That's not a popular message in our country. It's because our country's got stupid. Our country's not wise in how we view our faith. Maybe because I have spent a lot of time over the course of my life and ministry working with believers in other countries that have been oppressed. The underground church, they didn't have it good. They had it bad. But their faith was just remarkable. I, I could always learn from them, even though 
we were called to teach and do the stuff we were supposed to do. In some ways, it was really backwards, inside out and upside down, because they should have been teaching us. And I took advantage of whatever opportunities I've had to learn from them. Um, I'll be meeting uh, shortly with uh, one of the greatest men of God I have ever met. He and his wife run a Romanian Christian television network satellite system. The two most humble people you'll ever encounter. I hope you get to meet them. They're phenomenal. And uh, they come from a country where Christians were terribly persecuted. But the, you know, the gospel continued to survive without the help of prosperity preaching or false promises. I'm not saying prosperity is bad or God doesn't have real promises for us. Prosperity is okay. And God has real promises, and that's fantastic. Prosperity is not always a blessing. Prosperity can also not be a good thing. Poverty is hard, but it's not, it's not always a curse. It's, I'll be meeting with this man and his wife very shortly. I serve on their advisory board, and he's going to update me. I'm going to hear an update of what God has done in their work in the last year. And I'm going to be blown away because every year when we have, we get together, I'm astounded at what God does through the faithfulness of these two people. And God just brings humble servants to participate in humble activities that are changing lives in powerful ways because we serve a powerful God. That's ministry. It's ministry. God's good at what he does. He doesn't want to hold us back. He wants to push us forward, but not to our detriment. He, he is happy to help us do what he's called us to do, as long as it's not to our detriment, hurting us by causing us to believe things that aren't true or to be misled or to become prideful or to become dependent on things that are not him. I love getting the opportunity of having my grandfather pour wisdom into me. All I can say is that God is good and he always provides. Even when we don't understand it, he is equipping us and making way for his will to be done, even if that's shooting TV programs in the living room. I appreciate how Crosstalk has always continued to put trust in God, even when the circumstances were not ideal. God is good and he does all things well. If you would like to keep up with us, follow us on social media at Crosstalk TV. We also post all of our programs on our YouTube, also at Crosstalk TV. I hope to see you next week as we continue this series. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.